Welcome and good afternoon. My name is Laura Heineck and I am a member of the customer care team here at Vitech Corporation. I am very pleased to be your host for this webinar today as we discuss five steps for improving your systems engineering practice. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to review a few technical details. First, questions. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time via the Q&A function in the GoToWebinar window. We will be monitoring these throughout today's event. We plan to respond to questions at the end of the webinar, so please keep your questions coming. We will probably not have time to respond to all of your questions, but we would like to know what's on your mind. Your questions will help guide our planning for upcoming webinars. Finally, recording. This webinar is being recorded today. If you are having technical difficulties during the presentation, an online archive with this presentation will be available within 24 hours of the live version. I believe that takes care of the housekeeping matters. Let's get started. I would like to take a moment to introduce Zane Scott, our speaker for today's presentation. Zane is the Vice President of Professional Services and Training Organization. For the past 30 years, Zane has built a skill set which enables him to provide insight and guidance to individuals and companies as they improve organizational processes and methodologies across their organizations. Zane is the author of numerous white papers, including Nine Laws of Effective, Effective Systems Engineering and is co-author of Vitex Primer for Model-Based Systems Engineering. Please join me in welcoming our speaker for today, Zane Scott. Thanks, Laura. We'll begin with a shout out to our host, Laura Heineck, and our brand new production engineer this afternoon, Eva Dace. Uh, appreciate all your help and work, guys. This afternoon, we're going to talk about uh, five steps to improve systems engineering processes. Systems engineering has always been critical, but it's becoming even more important in our world where the demands of time and pace and resources force us to do more with less. Systems engineering becomes even much more important than it was 10 years ago. Our target is the customer's target. And the way in which we improve systems engineering is by hitting the customer's target. That's our measure. How are, how are we able to deliver what the customer wants when the customer needs it? This is our ultimate standard. It's our raison d'etre or our reason for being. Not only do we need to be able to hit the customer's target, but we need to be both effective and efficient in doing it. To be effective, we have to be sure that we're doing the right things. And to be efficient, we have to make sure that we're doing things right. Ultimately, this has always been the test of systems engineering. The validation and verification domain tests the design against this standard. In validating the model or the system that we're designing, we ask ourselves, do we have the right system solution? And in verifying it against the requirements, we ask, do we have the system right? Have we been, in other words, effective and efficient? To quote Russell Acoff, who is a very distinguished uh, professor at the Wharton School and a seminal systems thinker, Professor Acoff says, we fail more often because we have the right solution to the wrong problem than because we have the wrong solution to the right problem. In today's world of scarce resources, we can't afford to answer the wrong problem, even if we have the right answer. And we can't afford rework. You'll hear people say, I don't have time, I don't have resources, I don't have time to take the time to do this right, to be sure that I'm getting it right. That's a very interesting statement because if you can't afford to do it right, how could you possibly afford to do it over? Delivering value without waste is the goal of lean practices. It's the goal of nearly every best practice model out there in the management world. 
we have to learn to sort out the value adding from the non-value adding process steps. Today we're going to talk about five value adding steps to build our systems engineering practices around. How do we stay value adding? We stay value adding through these five steps. Step number one is to maintain a systems view throughout your design process. Step number two is to minimize the risks. In step number three, we make your practice agile and responsive. In step number four, we shape our processes to converge on a design solution. And in step number five, we account for the system context. We'll discuss each of these in some detail as we get through the program today. These have been selected because they are all addressing particular problems that confront the systems engineer in today's world. So let's get started. Step number one, maintain a systems perspective. This is arguably the most important step in among the five. We have to maintain a systems view. We do that because it makes the pieces of the system fit together in a logical, coherent way, and it makes sense of the system design. In fact, without this view, the system design can't make any sense. The pieces very likely don't fit. When you're working a puzzle, it's very helpful to have the puzzle picture on the top of the puzzle box to use as you try to make the, system, the puzzle pieces fit together. It puts the individual pieces of the puzzle into context as you look at them. In the same way, the systems view puts the individual pieces of the systems de design into context. How do we climb that step? We begin with a high level description of the entire system. Now lots of times if you go to a high enough level, you're know, you'll know you're there because the people around you will begin to say, well everybody knows this, this is a waste of time. They'll almost never tell you who everybody is, and they'll almost never tell you what it means to know this. But you really can't go to too high a level. The reason that, that you can't go to too high a level is that you're going to drop down, and we'll talk about this, you're going to drop down in detail until you wind up with a detailed model. Then we incorporate all four of the systems engineering domains. The classic systems engineering domain are the requirements domain, the behavior domain, the architecture domain, and the validation and verification domain. These are all held in relationship and we need to think of them at every level of detail. So as we increase the detail in our systems design, we need to be thinking about all four domains and fully develop those domains to the level of detail where we are. That's because we're proceeding with an increasingly detailed description. At each level, we flesh out more and more and more of the detail involved in the design until ultimately we're able to arrive at a sufficiently detailed description of the design that we can actually construct and implement the system. We address all aspects of the model, all of the domains. We address the requirements at each level. We address the behavior at each level. We address the physical architecture at each level and we address the validation and verification at each level. Now at high levels we may have lots of so-called gray boxes that don't have a lot of detail. Uh, at the highest level the physical architecture is almost always one single box essentially labeled the system. 
Uh, as we begin to develop the detail, we invade those gray boxes and unbox, unpack the detail and make the design choices. By increasing the detail level by level by level, we are making design choices intentionally and we make those design choices across all four domains. That way we have solid assurance that we're not skipping alternatives or going down a path and, and forgetting to close other doors. Uh, we can arrive at the most detailed level confident that we have looked at all of the things that we need to look at. And that's why we hold all of the domains in relationship across each and every layer. We keep their relationships, the relationship between requirements and behavior. Uh, requirements are the basis of behaviors. Behaviors are based on requirements. The system should not be doing anything that is done in anything other than satisfaction of the requirements. The behaviors then are allocated to the physical architecture, to the components of the system. And the components are all expressions. They're all alloc have allocated behaviors tied to them so that the physical design makes sense in the context of the behavior that's necessary. And then when we validate and verify, we look at the physical architecture at that level of detail against the requirements at the same level of detail. That way we hold all the domains in relationship across each layer as we increase the detail. In step two, uh, we minimize the risks. Now the funny thing about saying minimize the risks is that the first thing we ought to say about this is don't introduce risks yourself. Very often we introduce risks and this is the most glaring error so I, I won't go into lots of risk mitigation strategy and all of those kinds of things. We could stop here and spend the entire afternoon. But I'm going to talk about some ways that we introduce or create risks and give ourselves self-inflicted wounds. So how do we create risks? One of the primary ways that we can create risk is through the stove piping that comes about when we begin to deal with the different domains separately when we begin to operate within each domain as if the other domains didn't even exist. Uh, this is a major source of risk. This results in stove piping. Uh, we, we, we lose work. Um, we pursue one domain and, and we lose work in other domains as it would be expressed in the domain that we're looking at our view becomes myopic. We lose the systems picture. Uh, we develop communication problems. The most subtle risk of all is that the domains become so specialized that we have people who think that they work only in that domain. We've all participated in projects where we had people working on the project who say things like, I'm a requirements engineer. Uh, I'm, an, I'm a system architect and they have to be very, very careful that they're not by implication in those statements by, by claiming those names, excluding themselves from the relationship of, of that area to the other areas of the design. We're systems engineers. We're here to coordinate specialists, not to be specialists. So we have to be careful of the communication, the work, and the data loss, those risks that can result from the stove piping. How does this work? Well, let's use football as an analogy. Uh, if you're looking, you'll notice that most of these illustrations are uh, my Hokies. So, uh, you'll be clear about where my loyalties lie. Um, 
this is a rather complicated play. It's much more complicated than, say, a straight dive off tackle. Why is it more complicated? Why is it riskier? Because it involves more exchanges of the ball. So you see, we begin with a snap from center. And the center snaps the ball to the quarterback. The quarterback pitches out to a back in the backfield who runs across and then he's asked to pass to the wide receiver. And incidentally, if we have any Michigan fans in the in the audience, that's a picture from last year's uh, uh, bowl game in which Tech played Michigan and that's Danny Cole. He actually made that catch. That was the winning touchdown. Uh, although the referee wasn't able to see it that way. Uh, that's the way we think of it in Blacksburg. But you see the exchanges, the pitch to the back, the back's pass to the, to the wide receiver and the beginning snap. All of those are risks. Why? Because we risk dropping the ball. Uh, we risk a fumble on any one of those particular exchanges. So we can have those kinds of exchanges. If the center is a requirements tool, and the requirements tool uh, exchanges the ball to a behavior modeling tool, and then the behavior modeling tool exchanges the ball, the data, to an architecture tool, and then the architecture tool sends the data to the validation and, and verification tool. All of those are risk points that are introduced by the way we choose to execute our systems engineering processes, by the ways in which we choose to exchange data. Everybody's played the, the telephone game. You know the problems with communication. You say something to the first person who says something to the second person, who says something to the third person. And by the time we get around to the tenth person, what was originally said is not what comes out. Because we drop data, because things change, because we have the message as it's intended compared to the message as it's received. And this dilemma plagues us throughout, so we, we lose. Now we're told we're told along the way uh, by folks who have tool suites or use this approach, that doesn't happen on my team. You know, my team is coordinated. They're made to operate with each other. Uh, we practice together every day, so we don't fumble. Uh, any football coach knows the foolhardiness of that. The uh, ever witty Lou Holtz was playing uh, Woody Hayes and his Ohio State team, uh, and he was on Johnny Carson, and Carson asked him, uh, he said, you know, Coach Hayes has said that any time you put the ball in the air, three things can happen, and two of them are bad. And uh, I was wondering, with your passing attack, what do you think about that? And Holtz looked at Carson and said, Coach Hayes is talking about his receivers, not mine. Uh, we get that story a lot, and yet we know that every time we exchange the ball, every time we exchange data, every time we exchange work, that there's a risk of dropping it along the way. So how do we, how do we climb this step? How do we avoid creating this kind of risks? We suggest that the answer really is one model in one repository that is worked on by one tool. That means there are no handoffs and therefore there are fewer fumbles of data. You make an entry into the model through the single tool, no matter which domain you enter. You enter to work on behavior, you enter to work on requirements, you enter to work on architecture, you enter to work on simulations and testing, you enter through the same tool, you enter the same model in the same repository so your work is not dropped. 
there is not the level of communication problem that there is when you have to work in your tool, construct your model, and pass that along to another tool. Essentially, when you use separate tools, you wind up with four separate models in each of the four domains, and you have to communicate between them. So when you do work in one domain, and you have to manually make sure that that work is reflected into the other domains. So this is how we suggest that you climb this step and avoid creating these risks. Step number three is to make your practice agile and responsive. This is a huge issue today. There have been lots of, of attempts to address this. The traditional systems engineering practice was seen as rigid and unresponsive, uh, whether you call that waterfall or any of a number of names that it's been given. The idea was that you would enter the requirements domain, chase the requirements all the way out until you had them all codified, then take all of the requirements and completely construct the behavior. From the behavior, then you would completely construct the physical architecture, and then you would test the final architecture back against the final requirements. In answer to that, we've had such things as spiral development, rapid spiral development, uh, and from the software world, we're now seeing a, rest, a, a, a surge of agile approaches. All of these are an effort to make it more responsive because uh, sometimes the traditional process takes so long that the questions you were trying to answer when you begin the process are no longer even relevant questions by the time that we reach the end. We have to be agile. Our customers live in, an, in a dynamic environment. Uh, their needs are, are dynamic and therefore their requirements are dynamic. We have to be able to respond to their needs. We need to be able to answer the questions that are relevant for them. And we need to keep in mind that the ultimate date, the ultimate target that we're trying to hit is delivering a systems design that's relevant on the date that we deliver it. It doesn't do any good to say, hey, this responds to what you told me the requirements were when we started this 18 months ago. Uh, what we need to do is to deliver a system that meets the customer's requirements at the date of delivery. So how do we, how do we be agile? How, how can we be agile? Um, we think that in the process that we're talking about, in model-based systems engineering, where we go layer by layer, and incidentally, uh, at Vitek, we call that approach strata. Uh, in using threat strata, we feel like we can be more agile. Uh, and the key to doing that, the keys rather, are to maintain stakeholder connection and involvement. Stay in touch. If agile software development has anything to teach us in systems engineering, it's the lesson that we need to maintain connection with the stakeholders throughout the entire design process we need to tap into what they're thinking, what they're needing, because, because they're living in the world that they're going to take our solution into, and they're our connection to that. The second thing is that the behavioral domain is absolutely critical to agility. Now, we are regularly told by engineers, I don't fool with the behavior domain. Uh, I just allocate requirements directly to physical architectures. What happens when you skip the behavior segment, when you skip that thinking? And it's not so much that you're, you're skipping the physical process of instantiating it, it's that you're skipping the thought process. When you skip the thought process that, that lies behind 
the behavior domain. You're skipping the construction of the logical architecture of the system design. When you do that, you bring on rigidity because you're making physical architecture design choices without illuminating those choices with the logical architecture, with the behavioral domain. So we haven't done that thinking and we haven't made those choices with the help of that light, with the help of that understanding. And when that happens, your design becomes more rigid and less responsive. The fourth step is that we need to construct our processes in such a way that we can converge on a design solution. We need to have confidence when we get to the end of the design process that we have considered all of the relevant circumstances, constraints, limitations, possibilities, approaches, and that we indeed have answered the right question and that we have the right answer to the right question. The way that we do that is by using a convergent process. That's what is at the heart of our layer by layer dropping down through the levels and converging on a solution. As we drop through the levels, we deal with complexity by introducing the detail a level at a time. We deal with the decisions that need to be made at that level. And so we're able to look at the possibilities at that level, make choices about which ones of the doors of the design we need to go through, and confidently and rationally close the doors that we, we don't need to go through to go down paths that we don't need to follow. We can make our choices rationally and intentionally and then we can be confident that we have made the right choices. When we get to the bottom, we can be confident that we've dealt with all of the relevant issues and we've reached the right solution to the right problem. How exactly do we climb that step? How do we do that? We begin at a high level. Uh, we have a high level description. This means a low level of detail, a low granularity. And we increase the granularity, the detail in steps. But we only have to increase the granularity as we follow the design choices that we've made and converge on the solution. That way we're not simply beginning at the bottom with a totally granular uh, set of possibilities and face the, the problem of having to chase all of the different paths out to see where they lead. We rationally decide between A and B and C and D and we increase the granularity only as we need to so we finally emerge with a particular solution that happens to be the right solution to the right problem. Step five is a critical, a critical concept. We include this because this is something that is so often overlooked uh, and it can result in, in big time problems. Um, anytime we work on a system design, we need to recognize that there are three systems that we're dealing with. The first one we almost never miss. We know we're dealing with the system that we need to design. We understand that. That's the reason that we're gathered together. That's the reason that we're there working on the problem. So that system is right in front of us and we may ignore aspects of it or not be as thorough as we need to be, but at least we have that system before us. The second system is the system that we're going to talk about here in a minute. And that's the system in which our design system will live. Uh, that's one that very often gets overlooked or gets short shrift. 
in terms of treatment, and we'll talk about that. The third system is the system that we use to design the system. That's the system that we're really talking about throughout this. Our systems engineering processes are the system that we use to apply to the problem to come up with a solution. So we're dealing with that system, and that system is very often forgotten and not dealt with in a in a complete systematic way. But the one we want to address is the context system, the system in which our, our design will live. The interaction with the context is going to lead to consequences. Now when we design a system and place it into the context, we're putting it into the system in which the problem exists. And we hope that the interaction will lead to the consequence of solving the problem. But we have to be careful because we need to control the consequences so that we only get the intended consequences. A failure to adequately understand the context system leads to unintended consequences and that's always bad news. Now the little guy in the fur coat and his little furry buddy there are there for a reason. Uh, they're a great example of unintended consequences. Back near the turn of the century, uh, when furs were much more uh, popular and acceptable than they are today, the fur industry was on a quest. They wanted to find an animal that would bear a high quality, uh, very serviceable fur and do it at a very low maintenance cost. Um, they needed a, an animal, for instance, that would be disease resistant so you wouldn't have to spend lots of money trying to keep your, your group of them alive. Uh, they needed to be adaptable so that they could go and live wherever the, the uh, fur producers were located. They, they needed to be able to, to eat very cheaply, so that meant they needed to be able to eat just about anything. They needed to be prolific. Uh, in other words, if you got a few of them, you needed to uh, have them turn themselves into a lot of them with, uh, in very little time, with very little support. So around the world, people hunted for such an animal. In South America, they, they located an animal that fit the bill to a T. Um, I, I put a picture of him in there so that you can get a size. That's about the scale. Uh, if you want to think of this animal, it's basically a rat about the size of a small dog. Uh, the animal's name is a Nutria. He's very interesting. He has bright orange uh, front teeth. So if you're a Tennessee or Texas fan, uh, this guy is the perfect pet for you because he has uh, school colors for his, bright, his front teeth. It's eerie looking. Um, but he fit the bill. He'd eat just about anything. He could live in just about any climate. They produce, uh, a pair will produce about 20 young a year. So you can see, you know, that two become 20, become 400 in pretty short order. Uh, they're disease resistant. They don't have many natural enemies uh, and they can go anywhere. So they were perfect. So they were imported in fairly large numbers uh, first, I think, into the East Texas, uh, Western Louisiana area and they begin to thrive and to produce fur and their fur was very high quality and they satisfied all the requirements. The problem was that in satisfying the requirements that had been set out, they were also uh, setting up a disaster. They were so prolific that they quickly outstripped the ability of the fur producers to take care of them, to manage them. So uh, they breached containment pretty quickly and you begin to have nutria in the wild. Now that wasn't a problem for the nutria because they eat virtually anything and they could migrate because they could live in virtually any climate. 
and they were not killed off by disease. There weren't lots of, of natural predators. So they continued to be prolific and to expand and to migrate. And today, uh, they are a problem, for instance, in the uh, uh, national parks and wildlife refuges on Maryland's eastern shore. Uh, there are pictures of them uh, denuding the swampland uh, on the eastern shore. They're a huge pest and, and very difficult, very hardy, very difficult to get rid of without a lot of natural enemies. So they've become a nuisance. That's a great example of a system that meets the design criteria uh, that was introduced without any understanding of the context system and they became a much greater pest than they were ever a benefit. So we want to avoid that kind of thing and we avoid it by understanding the consequence. How do we do that? We need to map the system context. Uh, an accurate picture of the system context is necessary to our design because we need to know how the system is going to interact in that context. What's going to happen? We need to model our design system's boundary accurately and we need to understand and model the interfaces with the context so that we're clear about how this system will function and what all of the consequences are so that we don't get bitten by unintended consequences in the end. So let's recap where we've been. We've taken five steps. These steps are designed to improve our systems engineering process, to make us more effective, to make us more efficient, to be sure that we have the right answer to the right question. We've learned that we need to keep a systems view throughout our design process. We need to be sure that we understand the big picture and we need to keep that in focus. We need to minimize risks and especially to be careful not to introduce risks into our system design ourselves. We need to make our practice agile and responsive. And we can do this by increasing the granularity as we go and maintaining our contacts with the stakeholders and those who are asking us to solve a systems problem. We need to shape our process to converge on a design solution so that we can be confident that we have the right answer to the right, right problem. And finally, we need to account for the system's context. We need to be sure that we understand where this system is going, how it will function when it gets there, and what all the consequences of its introduction are. I appreciate your joining us today. Uh, we'll entertain some questions if there are, are those there who have them. We appreciate your time. We're happy to host you and certainly if we can be of any help or assistance to you in the future, don't hesitate to contact me. My data is there or to contact uh, Vitec uh, through the website or our community. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Zane. Um, now we'd like to move um, for your questions to our presenter. We've already received some great questions. Thank you for submitting those. I encourage you to join the discussion and submit your questions at any time via the Q&A function in the GoToWebinar window. Now let's get started. We have a question here from Jarrett. He asks, why is behavior so important? Why not just allocate requirements directly to architecture? Well, Jarrett, as we as we discussed, it's behavior that helps us to see what all of the physical architecture design choices are. And if we skip the behavior, then we skip the opportunity to do complete thinking about those design choices. Uh, we get tempted to latch on to a particular physical architecture and to not think about 
uh, the other alternatives that are there that would be logically shown to us by considering the behavior. Thank you, Zane. Um, I also have a question here from Charles. He asks, how does having a single tool, single repository, help keep the design, design on track? Well, Charles, that's of course the uh, minimizing the handoffs and keeping the data flow within the same model, within the same tool so that, so that we don't drop. That's where our football analogy comes in and we're not exchanging the ball, we're not exchanging data uh, between a requirements tool and a behavior tool or between an architect or architecture tool and a behavior tool or you know any of those possible combinations so we don't lose anything in the translation. Okay, thank you Zane. Uh, that wraps up the Q&A for today. If we weren't able to answer your question during the QA portion of the presentation, we will contact you directly after the webinar to ensure that your question is answered. If you have other questions or comments that you didn't send in today, we invite you to post those on the forum of our community site. You'll find that at community.vitechcorp.com. A recording of today's webinar will be posted to our website, vitechcorp.com, by the close of business tomorrow. In closing, I would like to thank our presenter today. I'd especially like to thank all of you for joining us as we kick off our fall webinar series. As we bring this webinar to a close, a survey will open on your screen, either in a new browser tab or in a new window. Please take a moment to provide us with feedback on today's presentation and what topics you'd like to see covered in future webinars. Thank you all for joining us and have a great afternoon.